Within a few years, more than 5,000 intellectuals, worldwide, have outed themselves openly, online by signing their legitimate doubts about the authenticity of William Shakespeare from Stratford. Reasonable doubts, inherently, had to lead to the search for alternative candidates for the playwright genius of the works of Hamlet, Othello, King Lear, Romeo and Juliet, and so on. Such reasonable doubts, ever since have been ridiculed by their opponents, because of the impossible and devious number of 75 candidates, having been collected. Stratfordians were never ready, reflecting more plausible theories with no necessary 75 candidates but with a singular, outstanding artistic and spiritual contemporary genius, identical with the true Shakespeare, having fabricated, for life-saving reasons, ingeniously, multiple faked identities of himself. The greatest misconception was possibly, to look for a single, other name of the true playwright genius, instead of realizing, that the only existing true, life-threatened poet and dramatist genius was forced, to abandon identity in name and to make himself invisible, with a multiplicity of pseudonyms, including Shakespeare, Drayton, Chapman, Haywood and so on, but also with much lesser known contemporary poet pen names. This shall be the principal focus of this present video. Let's begin with reflecting some contextual arguments for Thomas Bastard. There are mighty hints that a certain Thomas Bastard is identical with Shakespeare, Marlowe respectively. His three published works, Crestaleros, Sermons, Magna Britana, reveal a lot autobiographical about Bastard. But, they make only sense, when assuming, Marlowe, as the author of these lines. Let's reflect and listen to a few epigrams. In, Crestaleros, Epigram 1, Book 2. We learn from Thomas Bastard. Thou, which deluding, raisest up a fame. Having shown. The man conceals his name. Does anyone really believe? That there was a then, already recognized, renowned but deceitful man. Who raised up a fame and had shown. He concealed his name. In, Crestaleros, Epigram 31, Book 1. We learn from Thomas Bastard, that when he lived, he was not estimated. Now, for dying, all men love him. He could revive, even if he would not. To loose men's goodwill. Can anyone really believe that Thomas Bastard, alias Shakespeare Marlowe, is not referring to the dramatist genius autobiographical play, Timon of Athens? The play ends with Alcibiades, reading the epitaph. Seek not my name, here lie I, Timon, who alive all living man did hate. In, Crestaleros, Epigram 21, Book 1, about the typograph. The author seems to have bargained with the printer for his book, but could not come to an agreement. It seems that he could not convince him in matters of his conceit of typography. A speculative interpretation. Could not perhaps Bastard's typographical conceit have something to do with the first folio's book typographical printing of the letter E. Shakespeare versus Shakespeare. In, Crestaleros, Epigram 15, Book 3. 
we learn from Thomas Bastard that in a poetic competition, he would have beaten the contemporary weighty poets Haywood and Davis. Is it conceivable at all that a totally unknown poet bastard in 1598 could rise above the contemporary poet elite? In Crestaleros, Epigram 37 Book 7, we learn from Bastard about his fatal fall. That is his life catastrophe, of which the world wanted nothing to know. That is, was not interested at all. Doesn't Bastard's fatal fall makes most sense? If we accept the name as an allegoric pseudonym of the true Shakespeare, In Crestaleros, Epigram 15, Book 6, Bastard reveals about the poet Samuel Daniel, allegorically, that he, Daniel, stole his, Bastard's, epigrams away. This definitely can be interpreted, also for other weighty reasons, that the poet Daniel belonged, as Bastard, to pen names of the true Shakespeare who allegorically seems to express that the stealing of Daniel hits his vein. It was his conceit, he, alone, is, doing the like. But you will not find him, he is, far to seek. In, Crestaleros, Epigram 35 Book 7, Bastard reveals with this epitaph the poet Sand's stunning secret about his life and death. Listen. Who would live in others' breath? Fame deceives the dead man's trust. Since our names are changed in death. Sand I was, and now am dust. The content of this epitaph for Sands corresponds to an absolute blueprint of the destiny of true Shakespeare. Be aware, plausible textual and contextual parallels between Sandy's and true Shakespeare have been observed and elaborated. But it was not Johannes Sands, but George Sands. Something seems to be incorrect or wrong here. Note that the same poem as in Bastard's Crestaleros 1598 appeared 40 years later, 1640, in the anonymous bestseller, Wit's Recreation. But, now without the pre-name Johannes, but with the title edition. On, Master, Sands. These stunning inconsistencies most likely can be resolved if we assume that we are dealing not with Johannes, but with George Sandys. The amazing degree of word, of sentence and text parallels between Shakespeare's and Marlowe's works on the one side and Sandys' works on the other can by no means be purely coincidental. These examples out of many more, should be enough to make you wonder about the authenticity of Thomas Bastard. The arguments support the assumption of Bastard as a pen name, identical with the anonymous author of Wit's Recreations, the true Shakespeare. Let's continue with reflecting some contextual arguments for John Bodenham. Encyclopedias tell us that John Bodenham was an anthologist whose anonymous books somehow were compiled by him. This can be deduced from the introductory dedicatory texts to him, such as This hymn of praise identifies him as the first causer of these poem collections. 
nightly, that is, in obscurity, brought home. As a laborious spirit. As a workman. With deserving fame. With a renowned name. Leaving it richly to posterity. Who was John Bodenham? The most plausible logic answer. It has been concealed, true, Shakespeare, alias Marlowe. Who fabricated this pseudonym from John Bowden? A celebrated French philosopher and publicist. Favorite of Marlowe and informant to W. Cecil. According to Arthur H. Bullen, Bodenham did not edit any of the Elizabethan miscellanies attributed to him. It is inconceivable that in the heyday of the true Shakespeare's creativity, an unidentifiable John Bodenham did compile the mighty and almost complete literary treasure of England. It is hard to understand why an interpretation of the title emblem of Bodenham's Belvedere was never attempted or possible by literary studies, although it must have had a pioneering meaning. Can anyone imagine that in 1600, this emblem symbolized the contemporary authorship riddle? The emblem unmistakably represents two burial mounds decorated by two flowers a marigold and a violet shunned by the summer sun be aware that marina in shakespeare's autobiographical play pericles exclaims the purple violets and marigold shall as a carpet hang upon thy grave while summer days do last born in a tempest when my mother died this world to me is like a lasting storm worrying me from my friends Belvedere. The early modern printed commonplace book, consisting of 4,482 few line passages of decasyllabic verse. Arranged under topical headings, including many quotations of Shakespeare and of Christopher Marlowe. The very last topical heading in Belvedere is, On Death. There you read, Thy fatal end, why doest thou so begin? A freezing death, on whom the sun has ever shone. Death steal your joys, but, steals not my breath.
Shakespeare. We must be silent in thy praise. Because our encomians will, but blast thy bays. Which envy could not, that thou didst so well. Let thine own histories, prove thy chronicle. Let's turn to Richard Brathwaite. Encyclopedias tell us that Richard Brathwaite was an English poet and author of works of unequal merit, such as The Golden Fleece, The Poet's Willow, A Strapado for the Devil, Nature's Embassies, Drunken Barnaby's Four Journeys, The English Gentleman and The English Gentlewoman. Amazing contextual connections between the true Shakespeare and Brathwaite have been observed, suggesting a pseudonymous identity between both of them. Let's demonstrate this at first in a few details from epigrams and satyrs. In Brathwaite's A Strapado for the Devel. The author in this satire on Silists and on Poetasters enlightens us about the highest level of those London poets as Lovely Wither and Bonnie Brown, prettily shadowed in a borrowed name, who so well can write what our older poets could never do. Be fully aware. George Wither and William Brown unmistakably are pen names of the true Shakespeare. Can it be purely accidental that Brathwaite's satire upon a poet's palfrey alludes not only to Marlowe's play, Tambelaine, but with the exclamation, Hallow ye pampered jades of Asia. Also to Shakespeare's Henry IV Part II Scene 4, in which Pistol exclaims, Shall pack horses, and hollow pampered jades of Asia. Is it really accidental that Brathwaite's satire upon a poet's palfrey, with the title word puns, of Marlowe's Leander, Lave and Darar, Provender, begins with an allusion in the first epigram to Richard III's exclamation in Shakespeare's play. A horse, a kingdom for a horse. What is this all about? Note the distortion of word meaning. The shadowed and borrowed names, Wither and Brown, are poet pseudonyms or pen names of the true Shakespeare, alias Marlowe, similar to Richard Brathwaite's name.
similar to John Bodenham's commonplace books in the late 15th century. A certain John Cotgrave wrote a commonplace book, in later decades, entitled The English Treasury of Wit and Language, which, similar to Bodenham, carries two strong autobiographical traits of the true Shakespeare. For this to be pure coincidence. Let's illustrate this with some examples. The book intersects with sentences and wisdoms under 200 topical heading, such as bastardy, burial, death, ceremony compliment, content, conceit, history, etc. etc. Under the heading of burial, we read Rich men do not go to the pit hole without compliment of Christian burial. It seems, if I had lived to have made a will, I should have died, as the best gentleman in the parish. Had my monument in a conspicuous place, of the church, where I should have been cut in a form of prayer. And so, for haste, to be in heaven, went thither, with my book. What an unbelievable disclosure, of the true Shakespeare. With an obvious reference, to the Stratford Monument. If a man does not erect, in this age, his own tomb. Before he dies, he shall live no longer in monuments. Then the bell ring, and the widow weeps. That is, an hour in glamour, and a quarter in room. Therefore it is most expedient, for the wise. If his conscience find impediment. To be trumpet of his own virtues. Can anyone really assume that the author isn't a pen name of the true Shakespeare? Note the allegorical pun. That is, to erect his tomb already, before he dies, but will not descend in the tomb. How can any monument say? Here rest these bones till the last day. What care I then? Though my last sleep be in the desert, or in the deep. And at the last day, I shall be found. Cotgrave, the true Shakespeare, hopes that his secret, the deceit with his monument, will be found out, finally. It wouldn't be difficult to show numberless similarities in content and context between Cotgrave and the true Shakespeare, supporting the assumption that Cotgrave must have been a pseudonym of the real Shakespeare. But let us close this by adding only a few more examples at this point. Oh, what a grief it is that a man should live but once in the world and then, to live a bastard, half damned, in the conception by the justice of that unbribed everlasting law. Note the allegoric pun. I should live but once, in the world, and then, to live a bastard. Be aware, the true Shakespeare suffered from the stigma of bastardy for his life.
Cotgrave openly confesses his own problem. Who lives, that can assure the truth of his conception? Adding the alluding, question. Is not miserable valor then, that man should hazard all upon things doubtful? And doesn't the last question remind to Shakespeare's Hotspur in Henry IV? The nice hazard of one doubtful hour. Under the heading of the people, Cotgrave deals with Coriolanus. The only word Cotgrave exchanged from Shakespeare's Coriolanus's play to his own topic of the people was Coriolanus to he himself. Under the heading of Astrology, Astronomy, Cotgrave is concentrating only on himself when expressing, I am nobler than, I am the baser, I am the greater, I have a will, I have faculties of choice, and then quoting the famous Hamlet utterance, to do or not to do. Can it be purely coincidental? That Cotgrave uses Shakespeare's famous Hamlet utterance. To do, or not to do. In Cotgrave, under the heading of Conceit, we read. There is no truth of any good to be discerned on earth and by conversion not therefore is simply bad. Informing kings, as he conceives, they looked. Though thy were nothing so. So all things here set down from men's conceits, which make all terms and actions good or bad. These sentences mirror the true Shakespeare's fundamental complementary philosophy, in Hamlet. Note, all, depends on your perspective thinking. Put it into feigned images of truth. Hamlet, there is nothing, either good or bad, but, thinking makes it so. Under the heading of Ingratitude, Cotgrave conveys the autobiographical parable of Shakespeare's play, Timon of Athens, which allegorically depicts the attitude of the true Shakespeare. That is, the ingratitude of the world to the true Shakespeare. Can it be really coincidental that Cotgrave let the essentials of Shakespeare's play, Timon of Athens, shine through? The main theme of the play is the ingratitude of the world, as the heading, first and last words of the lines imply. 
You can't buy friendship. Under the heading of continents, Cotgrave puts the question, if the virtuous muse of continents dared more than Shakespeare's Lucrece to, allegorically, kill herself and do something more miraculous to preserve her name white to posterity. It must be argued that there was a clear motive why Marlowe, the true Shakespeare, published his first opus of the rape, of Lucrece, so shortly after his final disappearance in 1593. It was a poetical allegoric inner dispute or metaphor of his crime against the Virgin Queen. Cotgrave rants allegorically about history. There were, too, few things committed to memory, but those, well worthy the preserving. Now every trifle must be wrapped up in the volume of eternity. A cobbler cannot die, but his name is immortalized with an epitaph. With all those contextual arguments, knowledge and associations to the true Shakespeare, alias Marlowe. Can anybody reasonably argue against John Cotgrave, as a plausible pen name of the true Shakespeare? Encyclopedias tell us that Francis Hubert was an English poet, known because of his two books published in 1629-31. This information is scarcely satisfactory, as it leaves crucial questions unanswered, such as How can it become conceivable that Marlowe's play Edward II, whose autobiographical protagonist, Gaveston, had already extensively been handled by Drayton, was again dealt with by a certain Francis Hubert, who, believe it or not, composed 648 royal rhyme poems. How could he have written, without any previous training, such a highly sophisticated piece of poetical literature?
this can only become conceivable when you add Francis Hubert to the multitude of the true Shakespeare pseudonymities. That is not too difficult, the contexts of Hubert's poems can easily be brought into connection to Marlowe's work in Destiny. A few examples. Two hundred and five. Yet before he went, as go he must, and did. Dear Prince, saith he, wherein have I misdone? That I am banished thus? Doth Edward bid? His poor, yet but his own poor pierce, to shun. His gracious sight? Must I from England run? He bids, I must, farewell, yet think of me. Though body goes, yet stay as my soul with thee. 228. How Gavestan, the third time banished, did live in Dutchland, where he found no rest. How he returned, how I was famished. Did feed on him, as on some dainty feast. How ill my peers his presence did digest. I do but touch at, now my muse unfold. How till his fall he bear him proud, and bold. But also in Hubert's poem, Egypt's favorite, you learn from his poems, with 586 stanzas. Sixty. Methinks I hear him say, and saying weep. How unexampled is my wretchedness. My sea of sorrow is so very deep, that there's no line to fathom my distress. 61. Oh, by what name shall I express my ill? It is not banishment that I endure. I am too truly in my country still. But banishment were better, more secure. 67. Where I am neither living, nor yet dead. And yet am both, I know not what I am. But this I know, that never was there bred. Amongst all men a more disastrous man. 68 which am deprived of that common good, that all mankind, nay very beasts possess, air, light, heat, motion, and all hope of food, who, though I live, yet can I not express. 